Well, welcome back. It's always a surprise to see who comes back. Uh, and uh, you are what is called the faithful remnant. <laughs> and thank you for uh, your participating. We're uh, picking up uh, here in this lecture, the land and the king of the promised plan. Uh, so I'm going to begin right away by talking about the book of Deuteronomy. It consists of the final sermons of the first leader of Israel, Moses. And the book of Deuteronomy was uh, not, as the title suggests, a second law, Deutero, second Nomos, nome, anonymy, uh, second law, uh, which title was given because the Greek Septuagint translation incorrectly based it on Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. The emphasis of this book fails, uh, uh, or excuse me, or falls on the grace of God despite the nation's constant pension for sinfulness. Israel just missed it time and time again. But the grace of God was greater than anything that uh, came in Israel's sin. So a better way was uh, marked out for Israel's lifestyle in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, which says... The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your lives. Well, the book of Deuteronomy also reflected the literary type found in the pattern of the second millennium Susandry treaties, which treaties were made between the great king and the nation that he had subjected it to battle. The outline of those treaties matches exactly the form of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, this is interesting because uh, Scholars of the liberal persuasion said Deuteronomy was not written by Moses, but actually is the D document, which was found in 621 B.C. Some of you may have been to university where they taught J-E-D-P. Those letters stand for the Yahwistic or Jehovahistic uh, portions of the scripture, which they said were stories told by uh, these uh, uh, meandering people uh, in the 8th century. Then the second uh, group of them in the 7th century used Elohim. So they were the E documents, not J but E. Then D came to try to straighten them out. And they said, what does God really want? And they said the earlier books were saying he wanted blood. But they said, no, help the old lady across the street. Uh, be kind to your enemies. Be kind to animals. So that was more of what D was for, which is most of the book of Deuteronomy. And then P, finally the priest got their day. You can always tell a priestly document because it said so many boards on this side with so many nails on this side. So they put so many boards on this side with so many nails on this side. And the Lord looked and saw so many boards on this side with so many nails on this side. Uh, they said, it's boring. It's redundant, and so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, who is the father of so-and-so, who is the father of so-and-so. And they said, that's the priestly document. 
Well, that whole thing collapsed. Why? Someone uh, from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, found out reading these treaties, they said, whoa, wait a minute. Here are treaties that are made by the Hittites up in present-day Turkey, and they follow the same kind of uh, outline as Deuteronomy. They have a preamble, first of all. Well, so does Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Then they have a historical review of the relationship between the great king and the subjected kings. Well, so does Deuteronomy, between God, the great king, and his people Israel. Deuteronomy 1, 6 through chapter 4, uh, verse 49. Then they have basic stipulations. Well, so does Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 1, through chapter 26, verse 19. And it has sanctions or penalties for uh, uh, not following uh, the, what they promised here. And so you have curses and blessings. Well, so does Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 27, verse 1, through chapter 30, verse 20. And then you have witnesses to the treaty. Well, so does Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 47. Well, you look at all of these, and there are provisions then finally for reading and storing this document. And guess what? That's what we have in Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 30, and then chapter 32, 48 through 34, 33. Now, here's the point. That is second millennium, 1400 B.C., approximately the middle of the second millennium. And guess what Moses wrote about 1400? Now, later on, they used the same style in Assyria all the way down to the first millennium. But they drop out the historical review and another section. So it's shortened. So without arguing for inspiration, which we do, but makes no sense to liberals, we say, hey, on your own literary style format, look, the book is written when it claimed to be written. And we're following your scholars. So, <laughs> excuse me, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, because it shows the biblical text is real. More than that, by the way, we found on a hill opposite Jerusalem uh, a cave where people had been buried in the 700s. Guess what? We found their amulets, little silver amulets, which were on the, around the neck of the deceased. And here, when they were rolled out, what were they inscribed with? The words out of the ironic benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up your countenance and give you peace. So, from when we go all the way back to 1000 AD, and now we're going all the way down to the 7th century BC, the words were practically, except for one or two, two spelling errors, identical. That's preservation of the text. That's real preservation. And anyhow, the people said that benediction wasn't in print yet because that was done by the priest. 
and only came in 400 BC. So what are these guys doing with it? And they're dead for already two, 300 years. I don't know if you get the point, but I was happy. <laughs> and you should be too. <laughs> so the inheritance of the land becomes an important part of God's promise. What really characterized this period from the end of uh, time exhibited in the first five books in the Pentateuch until the conclusion of the period of the judges was the concept of the inheritance of the land. Deuteronomy, in anticipation of God giving the land of Canaan to the Jewish people uh, some 69 times gave his pledge that Israel would one day possess and inherit the land of Canaan. Uh, 69 references. Uh, that must mean it was important. That must mean that the Lord didn't want us to forget it. That must mean that the Lord wanted that as one of the key points that was uh, made here. So over and over again, God referred to this land as his gift to Israel in some 25 references. Who owned that land? God. Not the Palestinians, not the Jewish people. God owned it, but he gave it as a gift 25 times in the book of Deuteronomy alone, like Deuteronomy 120 or 125 or chapter 2, verse 29. So it is true, however, that the Lord said, the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers, Leviticus 25, 23. But the assertion was not at cross purposes with the promise God had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the land, like the whole earth, belonged to the Lord. Psalm 24, 1, again. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So who owns the territories of the world, the land masses? God. God owns it. Uh, so God owns me, and he owns what I think I own. Uh, he owns my house, my car, my land, and the time payments thereof. The whole thing is owned by the Lord. So thus, the land was a gift, but Israel had to what? Claim it. They had to possess it. And the way divine sovereignty and human responsibility were complementary uh, in bringing this together is important. So what is the theology of the land and particularly the theology of the doctrine of rest, R-E-S-T? One of the new provisions in the expanding promise plan of God was the provision of rest for the land and people of Israel. The rest was so special that the Lord would cast it or call it my rest. For example, Psalm 95, verse 11, or Isaiah 66, verse 1. After Israel left Egypt, they were prepared for their journey of 40 years. Now, they didn't need to put in the 40 years. When they got to Sinai, it was 11 days to come to Canaan. It says so in the beginning of Deuteronomy. But they rebelled. And therefore, God said, that generation must die off. And they did. Not one, oh, except... Uh, Caleb and Joshua. There were two. 
Only two from that generation survived because they trusted the Lord. They were among the uh, 12 spies that went into the land, and they came back with a good report. Yes, there are giants in the land. Yes, there are walls, but we can take them because our God is greater than they are. But the other 10 spies said, oh, no way, no way, no way. And Israel believed the 10, a real democracy. And so they did not go up in the land. And the Lord said, all right, you didn't believe, you won't see it. And they didn't, except two guys, Joshua and uh, Caleb. So there was more to their concept of the rest than mere geography. For rest was also the place where the Lord stopped on the wilderness wanderings. Uh, and uh, it was the place where the Lord dwelt. First Chronicles 28, verse 2. Or Psalm 132, verse 8 and verse 14. Did not King David stress the aspect of belief and trust as the basis for entering into that rest? Again, Psalm 95, verse 11. So the condition was not an automatic one, for it called for a spiritual decision from each individual. In fact, uh, that concept is born out in Joshua 21, verses 44 to 45. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. So uh, we have here, therefore, the concept of the rest, which had both the material or physical and spiritual side to it. God's purpose was not one that would fail, but rather each generation of Israel uh, retain her privilege of uh, remaining in the land. And it would be uh, another uh, matter. She had to choose life so as not to choose death. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. When God raised the conditional, if you obey me, he was not paving the way for declension or moving away from the grace and now moving into law. The, uh, the if there had an altogether different meaning, as we've already uh, pointed out in previous uh, lectures. The rest of God was not a blank check in which all generations could rest on their laurels and uh, forget God's ethical standards. The promise would be theirs only if they appropriated for God's name to dwell in the land. In the place of rest, God would make his name dwell there. God would deliberately put his name in that place so that the name might be present there. 1 Kings 8, 16. 2 Kings 23, 27. God's name stood for his whole being, his character, his nature, while God as transcendent had his permanent abode in the heaven, yet he was imminent and therefore he was present 
so as to dwell on earth in the place he had selected his name to appear, Deuteronomy 12, 5. So God sat down in heaven where he was enthroned, but he also tabernacled, he dwelt on earth. That's an amazing thing. He is enthroned in heaven and he dwells on earth. Later called his uh, uh, temple the place where indeed the tabernacle was set up. So Moses understood uh, what God was going to do. And Joshua, his understudy, bridged the gap from Moses to the times of the prophets, later known as Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, and the company of the prophets. These prophets not only predicted the future events as told by God, but more importantly, they were conveyors of the word of God. And they spoke against the backdrop of a nation that refused to listen and obey that word of God. Joshua is best known for his leadership in conquering the land of Canaan that God had given to Israel. Such wars were not to be fought without consulting the Lord and gaining his permission first. For later on, these wars would be known as Yahweh wars, not uh, holy wars, as some scholars say. Uh, but rather, these were wars initiated and devised by the Lord himself. When Israel went into battle at the Lord's command, Israel was assured that the Lord had given the enemy into their hands. Judges 3, 28. And uh, thus the Lord went before Israel and fought for them. The Lord could save by many or he could save by few. We saw that in Judges 7, verses 2 to 5, or 1 Samuel 13, verses 15 to 17. Even as Joshua began to get ready for the conquest of Canaan, he had a vision of the commander of the Lord's host. Uh, and uh, he stood as an angel of the Lord with a sword in his hand ready for action. And he declared himself to be for Joshua because Joshua said, who are you for, us or the other guys? And he said, neither, I've come as the captain of the Lord's host. So uh, often the Lord would send panic into uh, the hearts of the opposition or just plain uh, terror. And it would cause their overthrow. With the Lord's presence, Israel continued to be victorious. So in this type of warfare, the spoils were not to be looted and taken by Israel's conquering army. For everything in the city or the country under attack was a uh, uh, harem, H-E-R-E-M, another Hebrew word which means utterly to utterly destroy, harem. And therefore, it was set apart to the Lord. We know that word from Arabic where the Arabs set up a wall around their harem. That is, the wives that were set apart specially for the king or the potentate. But here in Hebrew, it is 
use the in connection with being totally uh, involuntarily given over to the Lord. There is voluntarily giving of oneself to the Lord, like in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, which always means cistern, too. So I, I beseech you, brethren and cistern, that uh, by the mercies of God, you present your bods a living service to the Lord. This is my own translation. Yeah, uh, so it's marginal. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, and that is a voluntary one. Harem is the opposite of that, in which God comes to a nation that opposes him and involuntarily takes it because it all belongs to him. So now we come to a messianic text in the plan of God, which is a prophet like Moses a prophet like Moses, in the promised plan of God. So just as long as Joshua lived, began Judges 2-7, on an ominous note, the people served the Lord. Have a leader there who is strong, and they'll serve the Lord. But from there on out, the story was one of disaster, why? Disobedience to the Lord. For the people departed from the Lord and did evil in his sight. Therefore the Lord said uh, to them uh, that he would sell them into the clutches of their enemies round about. Judges 2, 11 through 12. But never did he indicate that he would forsake his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, no. He would keep that promise all the way through. So occasionally, the people would cry out in repentance to the Lord, and they would return to him uh, to help the people in such recovery modes. God sent his people, the prophets. The earliest prophet to cry out to the people to repent was in Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, uh, 7, 3. And there you have the great word where God says, turn, turn. The Hebrew word is shuv, shuv. If you don't mind a little pun, God was trying to give them a shuv in the right direction. Uh, turn back uh, uh, to me. Uh, and that was the great theme that was to be found in these prophets. Uh, but uh, this text goes on to say, occasionally the people will cry out in repentance to the Lord, and they would return to, to him, Judges 3, 9, Judges 4, 3, to help the people in such recovery modes, God sent the people his prophets. And uh, thus the earliest one was one in which he uh, named Samuel, uh, turned back to the Lord. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 following, and Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 7, God promised he would raise up a prophet like Moses. These prophets had to be Jewish, number one. That was the first criteria. They had to be of your brethren. And he goes on to say, second criteria, they had to speak in the name of the Lord. They couldn't give it on their own. 
they had to say in the name of the Lord. Thirdly, they had to perform signs and wonders, miracles, along with their prophecies. Fourth, their fulfillment of the long-distance prophecies was judged by the near prophecies happening. If they couldn't predict something near happening, then what was the use of saying what's going to take place way later in the end days? Finally, fifth one, they were to make sure their words agreed with what God had already said. God would not contradict himself. So five criteria for prophecy. Had to be Jewish of their brethren. Had to speak in the name of the Lord. Three, had to do miracles. Four, had to predict near as well as distant predictions. And five, their words had to agree with what was already written. That's uh, the passage in Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 13, verse 1 following. But most of all, these prophets were to call God's people and the nations of the world to turn back to him and to repent of their sin. In fact, the message of the prophets could be summarized in 2 Kings 17, verse 13. 2 Kings 17, 13. It says this, Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey, that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. So what was the key? Repentance. Repentance, that was the basis uh, for any new work of God. Uh, and if they did not turn back, oh, if we do not as a nation turn back to God, there's disaster ahead. I mean, you don't have to uh, be a, uh, a rocket scientist to know this. You just see what God has done in the past. And when he calls and calls and calls, has God been calling the United States? Well, I think so. I would urge you, think about December 7th, 1941. I'm old enough to remember that. I remember. I was old enough to remember what happened. We were taking a little car ride on Sunday afternoon outside of Philadelphia, near, right near the Philadelphia International Airport. And we were listening to a religious broadcast, Percy Crawford, Youth on the March. And we interrupt this program to say, the United States of America has been attap attacked by the Japanese Air Force and Navy. Where is Pearl Harbor? They said it was Pearl Harbor. Well. United wasn't flying there in those days, so we didn't know. But boy, did we know from that day on. Life changed that day. Our little church outside of Philadelphia in a suburb, we generally had 200 the morning service, 50 at night, a holy huddle. Uh, and that's all it showed up, but not this night. We said we better go uh, 45 minutes early. Well, good thing, because we got there and all the pews were filled. I mean, even our pew, which was the third one from the front on the right, which was right alongside my grandmother's window. We had dedicated a window to her, and it said uh, uh, Mrs. Christine Kaiser, and here were raw pagans sitting in our row. And we were giving units. 
Yeah, that's what they called us. And guess what we had to sit on? Folding chairs. How many were there? 400 and some. 400. Why? Something had happened. Something had happened. And God spoke again. I don't know all these times, but I'm sure on Wednesday, what was it? Uh, April 19th uh, in Oklahoma City. Guy filled with a pickup uh, van, uh, filled with manure, set it off and blew 165 people into eternity, including 20 children. And they said, how did he do that? This was a foreign invader. No, no, it was one of the Americans. God was calling, calling, calling. And again, Columbine, remember that? And what's a guy doing shooting up a high school? But now it's become routine. Matter of fact, this past week, they shot up a whole church and almost took down all 50 of the people that were there. 450 shells dropped on that uh, uh, Baptist church in Texas. Uh, is God calling? Yeah, he called again, 9-11, yeah. Uh, and the 2001, calling, calling. I think God has been wrestling with the nations of the world, but particularly the United States of America, and is calling. In these criteria, the five criteria, they had to be uh, Jewish. Let me give you an illustration. Later on, I'll talk about David. And David has this nice uh, installation program and dedication of the new palace. I mean, it smells with cedar wood all over. You'd think it's a hope chest. The thing was so beautiful. And uh, Nate, the prophet, well, I feel I know him, Nathan, the prophet, Nate. They called Nate, and uh, he and David he said, David said, Nate, I think I'm going to build a house for God. Why should I dwell in such a nice place and God be in those old curtains? <laughs> They've been, you know, uh, cleaned and freshened up. Since 1400, it's now 1,000. It's time to get them to the cleaners. Uh, but um, they high-five each other, I'm pretty sure. It says that in the margin on my Bible. Uh, and they high-five each other, and uh, he says, Good, that night the Lord appeared to Nathan and said, Not so. Fortunately, you didn't say, Thus saith the Lord. That's not a throwaway line 5,000 times in the Bible. That is an authorization. That is authority coming from God. So he just spoke off the cuff. He said, I like the idea. Go do it, David. But the Lord said, not so. David can't build my house because there's blood on his hands. He's had to deliver this nation, but his son will. His son will. So back had to come Nathan and say, David, I made a mistake. Not so. Not everything a prophet says is inspired. Only when he says, thus says the Lord. And that he received it as a revelation. So beautiful. And uh, Nate, the prophet, well, I feel I know him, Nathan, the prophet, Nate. They called Nate, and uh, he and David he said, David said, Nate, I think I'm going to build a house for God. Why should I dwell in such a nice place and God be in those old curtains? <laughs> They've been, you know, uh, cleaned and freshened up. Since 1400, it's now 1,000. It's time to get them to the cleaners. Uh, but um, they high-five each other. 
I'm pretty sure. It says that in the margin on my Bible. Uh, and they high-five each other, and uh, he says, good. That night, the Lord appeared to Nathan and said, not so. Fortunately, you didn't say this thing in there, I'm sure. Okay, that's marginal. But it, I think it was going on like that. And Hanani sees him. He says, hey, what are you doing with that? Uh, get that off your neck. What's that supposed to mean? He said, the Lord's put a yoke on us. And if we don't think so, the yoke is going to be on us. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Well, at any rate, uh, <laughs> I don't want to have egg in my face. But at any rate, uh, uh, so what did Hanai do? He took it and over his knee, boom, busted it. He said within two years, all of the people that have been taken in exile and the vessels from the Lord's house are coming back. And Jeremiah said, amen. Then he went home and said, the Lord, what was all that about? I thought you told me to wear this yoke. And the Lord didn't say anything for a week. But at the end of the week, he said, make another one. Only make this one out of iron. Boy. This is going to, he built an iron yoke, double thing that goes on oxen. So he goes down the shopping center again. You know, excuse me, excuse me. Someone said, who's that? Someone said, that's our pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's squirming there between the, the two of them there. And uh, Hanani sees him again. He said, didn't I tell you to get that thing off you? He said, yes, but the Lord came to me and said, you didn't speak properly. Furthermore, you're a young man, but before this year is out, you're going to die. Two months later, all Israel was attending his funeral. I wonder what they said. <laughs> Boy, that Jeremiah was lucky. What a guess. Guess? No, no. He had a revelation from God. The words of a prophet had to conform to what God had said. God had said they were going to go in captivity long before he started. He tried to change it. But you can't change it at all. So let's go to the king of the promised plan. And God promised from the beginning that one day he would give them a king as far back as the days of Moses, Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 15. It says, when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you, and you have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king, the Lord your God has chosen. That's what he said. But in the interim, there were several false starts. There was, first of all, the offer to judge Gideon. You remember Gideon? Where the Lord told him, hey, Gideon, go out and pull down that Baal idol your father Joash has up out here. And he said, well, can I do it at night? <laughs> okay, go ahead, do it at night. And he pulled it down. Next morning, the whole town was mad. Hey, who ruined our God? I thought gods were supposed to fight for themselves. But they wanted to know. And they said, Joash, your, your son did this. And he wisely said, well, uh, Baal is a god. Let him fight for himself. So they hunkered down and I guess were told off on that. So they went their, their way. And uh, uh, God gave a deliverance to Gideon. The Midianites came up year after year after year and took all of their grain and uh, uh, grapes away from them. But uh, God gave Gideon a tremendous victory. 
But when he comes back, uh, his son was not as reluctant as Gideon was because they said to Gideon, rule over us. And Judges 8, 23. But Gideon said, no, the Lord will rule over us. I'm not going to rule over you. Uh, but uh, his uh, son came along, Abimelech. Avi, my father, Melech, king. My father is king. Uh, so somehow or another, I think it's probably to be translated, my father could have been king, but I'm going to be king. So he gets a couple cities, and uh, you know the disaster that came out of that. He finally has a millstone dropped on him from up in a tower. A lady dropped it on him. Boy, that's even worse to go down with, well, I won't be on that to uh, uh, just have a word of silence here. But um, uh, it would appear <laughs> that at approximately the same time as all this was going on, the little book of Ruth came along. Just some 85 verses and 1,294 words long and about a man from Bethlehem named, uh, well, Bethlehem Judah, named uh, uh, Elimelech and his wife Naomi, who immigrated <laughs> for a while to Moab to escape the famine. And while they were there, their two sons, Machlon and Kilion, uh, married Moabite girls. And then Limelech died, and the boys died. That left Naomi with Ruth and Ophrah, two Moabite girls. And uh, finally, Ruth goes back to the land of Judah with Naomi because the famine was over. And she went out in the field, as the Bible says, they were to leave the corners of their field for the poor people. So they're poor, all right. They have lost everything. And she begins picking there, and along comes Boaz. Who is Boaz? Well, it turns out he's a rally. He's a relative. He's a relative. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so... Uh, Naomi says, hey, look, uh, tonight, go find out where he sleeps. You know, he's out there on the, just where you go in the gate of the city. So that the wind blowing as they toss the grain in the air and let the grain drop because it's heavy and the chaff blow away. Well, you go there and when, he quits for the night and sleeps to protect his investment. Uh, go down by his uh, uh, toes on his feet and pull the cover over yourself. He'll tell you what to do. Risky kind of thing, I would think. But that's what she did. And in the middle of the night, Boaz is stirring his feet, and he sits up and says, who's there? And she said, Ruthie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got the intonation right. Uh, and uh, so she says, uh, uh, we're related, and if you want, uh, I'm available for marriage. You know, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, so he said, well, tomorrow we've got to go to the city gate where the ten elders are sitting, and we'll settle this. But there's one guy who is closer relative than me. He has first divs. So they went, and they said, uh, would you like to inherit uh, the land that we now found out belongs to Elimelech's family, 
And uh, he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, they said, in the day you do that, you also get Ruthie. You have to marry her. Oh, uh, no, he said, <laughs> my wife won't allow that. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, they have a ceremony. You take off your sandal, and uh, this person spits in their face. And that means you're giving up all claims. Well, that surely should do it with everyone looking on, you know. Who's this girl? And Boaz says, we're going to get married. I'm going to marry her. What a story. I translated that book uh, and uh, gave, I don't know, five, six lessons. And they put it in Chinese. And we tried and tried to get Bible study fellowship classes into China. Just about two months ago, the leaders of China all read it and said, it's okay. You can now use it for classes. And so they're teaching it right now, the Book of Ruth. We hope that's the forerunner of uh, 10 other classes that will be offered uh, not only in the three self church, but also in the underground church too as well. Uh, if you think of it, uh, pray with us about that uh, particular uh, uh, situation. So uh, what a beautiful book that is, Ruth 2.12. May the Lord richly repay you, Ruth, for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Took refuge under those wings. So that book, right during the time of Gideon, uh, it appears, and God was still working his plan. So there have been uh, further uh, false starts on the concept of kingship for it appears that people prematurely demanded a king in the days of Samuel. Now, Samuel was teed off. He cried all night long. He saw it, and in part it was a rejection of himself. 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 6. But the man who had been selected at that time as the first king of Israel was Saul. Saul. He was head and shoulders above all the rest of the people. At first, he was mightily victorious. First 20 years, there's only one paragraph in the Bible, 1 Samuel 14, 47. God, through his spirit, gave him wonderful victory. But then, he got impressed with his press releases. And he began to have pride. And therein was the problem. Because God would have established Saul's kingdom in perpetuity. He said so. 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 to 14. But the Lord now sought a man who would keep his commands. And Saul was not that man. God wanted a man after his own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14. That man was a shepherd boy. A young boy from Bethlehem. Same place where the Ruthie story took place. Uh, the eighth son of Jesse. And David was anointed, 1 Samuel 16, 13. And the Holy Spirit came mightily upon him. Although the word anointed appears some 39 times in the Bible and means Mashiach or Messiah, yet only nine of those 39 times does it point to the real Messiah the anointed one, our Lord Jesus, who was to come. So the third 
and uh, large prediction in the Old Testament is found in 2 Samuel 7. What do I mean by mountaintops? Well, I was asked to go uh, and speak to the uh, Greater Europe Mission missionaries in France. Someone called my house before I left and said, hello, I'm an airline pilot for United, and I heard you're going to be in Europe. I said, yes, that's right. He said, well, I would like you to go to Romania. Oh, I said, you can't get in there. You need a visa. Well, he said, better you don't tell them. Get the visa after you go there. I said, but you can't get in. Yeah, he said, I was there last week. So he said, you can. You and your wife should go. I said, but I promised my wife I'm a workaholic. I never take any time off. We have five days, and I'm going to tour Europe. He said, you can do that some other time. As if he were my father. Uh, and uh, he said, go to Romania. And uh, all right, I guess I'm supposed to go. So I went. And in Romania, I missed the flight to go to Radia, which was the city I was to go to, and speak at a church on Sunday to 800, which they also told me 300 of them will be communist, taking notes. I thought, this is interesting. But I never did get to that church through a mess up of airlines and schedules, we finally got there later the next day. And uh, uh, finally, I made connection. It's a long, funny story. But God providentially brought me so that without any directions or even with a phone, uh, I made contact with the people I was supposed to meet, Dr. Paul and Dr. Sam, just their first names. That's all I knew. I didn't have any other information. And uh, he said, Paul said, well, I'm late because someone phoned from Texas to Romania and said the Kaisers are coming. The message was intercepted. So they put my mother and grandmother in jail. So I'm there to get them out. Well, this is a wonderful start uh, for a speaking engagement. And uh, uh, so finally, that late that afternoon, he said, here's the story. 30 of our deacons have been jailed. They're in the jug right now. But we've got 30 more, and we're training them. I want you to teach the whole Old Testament tonight. They will come directly from work, 5 o'clock, and you have all the way till 10 p.m. But with an interrupter, well, interpreter. Uh, and uh, so uh, I thought, how am I going to teach the whole Old Testament? So I said, the Lord gave me an idea. I said, there are four mountain peaks. There is Genesis 3.15, the promise of the seed given to Eve. I said, that's one of the big mountain peaks in the Bible. You can't get by it without getting there first. Then I said, Genesis 12 and 15, the promise to Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant, that's the second big mountain peak. And then I said, there's a third mountain peak, which is 2 Samuel 7, David, the Davidic promise. And I said, there God promised a dynasty, a throne, and a kingdom to David that will last forever. And then the fourth mountain peak, I said, is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 
new covenant, new covenant. So the Adamic covenant, Genesis 3, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 15, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, and the new covenant, second, or uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. We're in that third mountain peak, third mountain peak. So enthused was David over the completion of his house that he told Nathan he was going to build a house for God. But the Lord said, not so, not so. Your son Solomon will do it because thus says the Lord. So there was a surprise for David for God was going to make a house out of him. He wanted to make a house for God, but God said, I'll make a Bayit David. Now the scholars up until 1994 said David is a myth. He's like the uh, table of uh, King Arthur's knights. It's a myth. That's what he said, especially those in Copenhagen School, the University of Copenhagen. was very, very strong on this. But God has a sense of humor. They were digging at Dan, way north in Israel. And what did they find? 1995 in 1994, two chunks of rock that talk about 11 kings, and one of them is who? David. And it's Beit David. Beit David, the house or dynasty of David. And they said, oh, it's probably a place name. Yeah, with seven other kings. Come on, guys, come up with a better one than that. Uh, uh, that just doesn't do it at all. So he says uh, he would have a long line of the seed of David descend from him and uh, he said he would be a son to God. God would adopt David's kid as a personal son and he would also be a father to him. Imagine the high, holy God taking on an adoption and adopting here, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Moreover, God would give David a kingdom and a throne that would last forever, 2 Samuel 7, 16. Well, David was so staggered by all that Nathan told him that he went into the house of God and flopped down. And he says, now, 2 Samuel 7, 18 and 19, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you've brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this sovereign Lord is, and now the translations go nuts. They really do. King James said, this, is this your usual way of dealing with man? All of that for Vazot, and this is Torah, Torah, you know Torah, uh, Adam. Uh, what does he say? He says, this is a charter or the law for mankind. This is the charter for mankind. He said, you're giving this to me. Are you telling me that what I'm trusting for my salvation, my putting my hope in that man of promise is going to come? Am I listening to the Abrahamic covenant that it's me and my family? The Lord said, yes, yes. So it's amazing to note, as R.A. Carlson pointed out, the special name for the Lord. 
in the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 15, verse 2 and 8, it is uniquely used here in the Davidic covenant as well. 2 Samuel 7, verse 18, verse 19, verse 22, verse 28, verse 29. And what is that name? Adonai Yahweh. This is too striking to be accidental. David suddenly realized that God was giving him the continuation of the plan that he inaugurated with Eve and with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so in David's prayer in 2 Samuel 7, and he prays, beginning verse 18, he gives thanks to God for the favor of God in his present situation and the work of God that had been performed for Israel and the plan of God in the past and the way God would fulfill his promise in the future. The best commentary on David's covenant can be found in Psalm 89, especially verses 28 through 38. But it begins, we used to sing a little chorus, maybe you have. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. Now the word mercies there are the blessings in the plan of God. I'm going to sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Uh, then he goes on, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. So skip the music, but uh, at any rate, you can see this was the promise that God made. And he rejoices over the immutability, the unchangeableness of God's ever, 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 I always get stuck on that word, everlasting covenant, which would endure forever. Psalm 89, verse 28, verse 29, verse 36, verse 37, forever, 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 forever. And he goes on to say, as long as the days of heaven, verse 29, or the days of the sun, verse 36, or the moon, verse 37. God would not lie to David, verse 35, for it would be the continuation of the promise made to uh, David. So there is nothing that comes close to matching the promise of the Messiah in any of the literature in the ancient Near East. Matter of fact, there is no such thing in the pagan cultures of the Near East as a messianic doctrine. This is brand new. And this is altogether different from all the other uh, nations. So this doctrine is unique and without any parallel whatsoever from any other nation in any other day. The teaching about Messiah, the anointed one, is not an accumulation of a number of disparate and unrelated predictions here and there from the ancient Near East. No, no, no. It is a studied reference that begins in Genesis 3.15 and continues with a huge outsplashing here in this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, uh, and especially in verses 16 and in verse 19. This, he is told, is the charter, the law for humanity. So how is the plan of God going to be realized uh, through David, 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 and his family? and his line, which, of course, leads right to uh, Messiah. So uh, the uh, plan of God, God not only gave the gift 
of government to David, but David was responsible for composing under the Spirit of God one half, almost exactly one half of the Psalms. Furthermore, God gave his son Solomon the gift of wisdom, and Solomon composed under the Spirit of God the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These books were further gifts in the promised plan of God. In the uh, Ecclesiastes, most people think that's a negative book and that it was written on Mondays. Uh, but uh, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now look, the word Havel is the name of that uh, 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 first boy, Abel, uh, Cain, and then Abel. And his name was Havel. We dropped the H again, just like we do on Armageddon, to make it Armageddon. And uh, why the parents named him Zilch, I don't know. Vanity, nothing, if that's what it means. But I argue, no, that's an improper understanding of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I think he's talking about change, 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 and therefore transitoriness of transitoriness, transitoriness of transitoriness, all is change. Yeah, except God. And that's his point. And he says there, uh, look, uh, eat and drink and enjoy your paycheck for it's a gift of God. What's he mean? Eat and drink because tomorrow we kick the bucket. That's what he didn't say. See, everyone says eat and drink because tomorrow we kick the bucket. Tomorrow we die. No, no. Eat and drink and enjoy the benefit of your pay because it's a gift of God. He keeps stressing that in the chapter 2, in chapter 3. End of chapter 5, verse 18, and again at the end of the book. So he said, here are the conclusions of the whole thing. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is the mannishness of a man and the femaleness of a woman. Uh, some argue there, what's the King James say? This is the whole duty but there is no word for whole duty. That's added. They thought they helped us. No, no, no. You want to know what a man's all about? What a woman's all about? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Uh, and it's right here. Uh, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. So the conclusion, fear God and listen to his word because that's what makes a man. That's what makes a woman. If you want to know what a man and a woman is. And same thing in Song of Solomon. Uh, Solomon is told by the Spirit of God to write a book on marriage. So what the living word did in John 2 by going to the marriage feast of Cana, one whole day out of the life of our Lord, which was so precious, he only has three years to teach these 12 guys everything they've got to know. So you can't take off time for a wedding, can you? Unless you want to teach something. So what the living word did by going to the marriage feast of Canaan, the written word did in Song of Solomon. One whole book on marriage. Yeah. And so what's it about? Well, this Shunammite woman lives in the town Shunam on Mount Mora. We know the town. We can see it today. Uh, and right from Jezreel, you can look right over across the 
uh, Israel on and Jezreel lowlands there where the Armageddon battle will be fought. And this girl is out tending the vineyard and the nut trees. And along comes Solomon with 60 of his men bearing him on his palanquin, like a big pool table with his throne set up on the top. And he comes along, dum, da, dum, da, dum, and she runs down to see what it, what's going on. And all the people with Solomon see this girl, and they say, Woo, there's a beauty. And they come, come, come. And they invite her to go back to the palace. She sees all the silver, all the gold, all the furs. But she's unimpressed. She's got a boyfriend back home, the shepherd. We don't know his name. She loves him. She wants him. Finally, she leaves the king and Solomon. And the book ends with this Shunammite girl being joined together with her shepherd boyfriend. So, in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, uh, love is as strong as death. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and uh, you can't put it out with fire. And riches and all the stuff you try to give, they just won't do it at all. But uh, it's a flame from Yah, Yahweh. Love is a flame from God. Everyone says that Cupid did it. Cupid, my foot. It's God that did it. That's the whole business there. And that's what that book is all about. So God gave his promised plan through his man Solomon. Even the book of Proverbs had as its motto, Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of living. It's the beginning of everything that you need. So, again, what did Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6, 7, place me as a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm? For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like the flame from Yahweh. Many waters cannot quench it. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to try to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. That's my translation. So these books were given during the kingly period in which God is giving not only a king, but the land to the people. And there is the theme that he tries to uh, bring out uh, for uh, all of us. Uh, so Proverbs is the book uh, which is mainly written by Solomon with the following purposes, to gain wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to teach prudent behavior, and to practice what is right, and to give prudence to those who are untaught and knowledge and discretion to the young. What a book of purpose, and yet almost totally avoided in that day and in this. So God gave to Israel both a place of rest, the land he had promised them, and a king to rule over them. Joshua was called by God, from being Moses' understudy and mentee 
to be the next leader of the people. Joshua led Israel in conquering the land successfully, but when he passed away, Israel fell into gross immorality and sin. Periodically then, after the people experienced the results of their sin, God would send one judge after another, calling them to what? Generally, repentance, which is exactly like the great book of revivals, Second Chronicles. Everyone thinks Second Chronicles is an historical book, or as someone said, hysterical book. No, no. It is a book on revivals. What is the theme of that book? Second Chronicles 7.14, which says, If my people, comma, I mean all those I've called my name over, comma, that's Gentiles, that's Israel, that's Moab, uh, that's the nations of the world, that's America. If my people who have my name called over them, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, number one, and pray, number two, and seek my face, number three, and turn from their wicked ways, number four, one, two, three, four, four commands. Then will I hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. What land? America? Uh-huh. So what do you have in the book of Second Chronicles? 15 out of the 36 chapters are reports of revivals. First one is during the days of Rehoboam. And four times there it said he humbled himself. Oh, very late, very late. Shishak, Pharaoh of Egypt, was beating up the place in 925, and uh, at the last hunk, this man finally cried out to God, and God gave them some relief. But they carted off most of the gold and silver from the temple. How do we know? Because we have a record of Shishak's son who loaded the temples, and we've calculated the amount of uh, gold alone, let me just uh, focus on that, 120 tons of gold. Do you imagine that? Uh, what is it now? Uh, $1,200 an ounce. Uh, it's been up to $1,600 an ounce. So we, well, let's see, for 120 tons, Let's figure that's a 2,000-pound ton, and we multiply 2,000 times the 120, and then multiply that by 16 to get ounces, and then multiply that by at least $1,200. Do you understand what we're talking about? We're talking trillions of dollars. Trillions be enough to get rid of our debt. Uh, in the United States. But at any rate, that was, uh, uh, we have that now substantiated from Egypt. That, and, and you ask where they got it from, and his father invaded the temple of God and took that away. He was the first one. But at the end, there's a fifth king, and that's Josiah. Good young King Josiah, eight years of age, comes to the throne. His father is no good, Amon. Why did they name him Amon? Amon Re is the sun god of Egypt. Amon. And he only reigns two years. His grandfather was Manasseh. He reigned 55 years and cut up the lake. There was no one more wicked than he. And who is his great-grandfather? That was Hezekiah, a good man, a good man. 
So a good man had a bad son, and he had a bad son, and then comes Josiah, and he goes all the way back from 640 to 1000 and gets his model in King David. Mm -hmm. And what does it say? Six times he humbled himself. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. So we need to humble ourselves. Oh, don't pray in the prayer meeting like one man always was known for. He had one prayer. Oh, God, he said, humble me. Well, one man finally had enough of that. And without tact, but certainly with truth, he said, humble yourself, brother, under the mighty hand of God. Uh, well, that was true. But that was not the way to do that. But uh, he did. So you have humble, humble from uh, Rehoboam, who came right after Solomon, and Josiah next to the very last. His children and uncle, uh, they finished off the line. But in the meantime, you have Jehoshaphat. And what was he told to do? Stand firm when he had three enemies coming against him, outnumbering him. Stand still and pray. And he prayed and sang songs. And God gave marvelous deliverance, Second Chronicles chapter 20. And what about uh, seek my face? Oh, that was King Asa, Asa. And you read 2 Chronicles 13, 14, and 15. And they saw it, the face, nine times. They saw it, they saw it, they saw it, the face of the Lord. And then finally, Hezekiah, chapter 28, 29, and 30 in 2 Chronicles. And what do you have there? that he turned from evil, turn from evil. So if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Ladies and gentlemen, that still is a current promise from God. Pray that God would send us a revival. Not only here, but around the world. We desperately need it. Or we're going to blow ourselves up. The North Korean thing is not just a flash in the pan. Unless God gives relief, by Christmas time we're going to be in a World War III unless God gives relief. So, uh, the plan of God, promised plan. Did he work it? Yes. Is he still working it? Yes. Will he work it in the final day? Yes. Yes. Well, let's take a uh, short break here.